Let us pray. O thou who art holy, the one who knows our names and the number of hairs upon our head, the one who calls us into existence, the one who brought us from eternity into temporal time and will take us home again, back to eternity with God's self. We stand here on this first Sunday of Advent 2021, and we first say thank you. Thank you because you have given us hearts and eyes and minds to see and know you and search for you and listen for you. Give us more strength, for the journey is not over. There is, there is much to do, and there are many miles to go, and we need you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> As I was preparing this sermon, I was listening to, as much as I could stand, the Rittenhouse child. And as much as I could stand, which was considerably less of the Ahmad Aubrey trial. And of course, the Science Custler child here in Strawbridgeville. And I reflected on what church is and this church and our world. And let me read the scriptures for today before I go further. <clears throat> on the cover, we have Listen now, you who know right from wrong. You who hold my teaching inside you, pay no attention to insults, and when mocked, don't let it get you down. Those insults and mockeries are moth-eaten from brains that are termite-ridden. But my setting things right last. My salvation goes on and on and on, as Isaiah 51, 7 through 9. And the key passage today is Isaiah 51, 4 through 6 both from the message translation. Pay attention, my people. Listen to me, nations. Revolution flows from me. My decisions light up the world. My deliverance arrives on the run. My salvation right on time. I'm bringing justice to the peoples. Even faraway land, islands will look to, to me and take hope in my saving power. Look up at the skies. Come to the earth under your feet. The skies will fade out like smoke. The earth will wear out like work pants. And the people will die off like flies. But my salvation will last forever. My setting things right will never be obsolete. I'm from a people who did not choose to come to these shores. We were brought here forcibly to be slaves. And for what, 400 years now, We've been trying to move forward and be treated like people, like everybody else. It is a great blessing that we are all different kinds of people in this room, in this church. Uh, but we don't serve God or each other if we say we are colorblind. We're not colorblind. I'm very black. <laughs> there's no getting around it. And there's nothing wrong with your seeing that I am. And there's nothing wrong with my seeing that some of us here are Caucasian. Some of us um, may not even know what we are, but what we know at the end is that we are all God's children. Mm -hmm. We are all peoples. We bring different lenses to reality. My experience means that I've experienced reality a little differently than some of you. And your experience means that you have experienced reality different from me. I listen to the young ones who say, why are you all in church? What does it do for you? And I have to take the question seriously because I'm a preacher of the gospel and it is my job, it is Pastor Liz's job, it is Reverend Greg's job to, t to take those questions and to answer them as best we can as God gives us utterance and as our spirits, our character allows, because what God says to us is reflected through who we are. And we have to take such questions seriously. And I've come to some conclusions in looking at this text 
I've been coming to it for a while, but these texts have kind of brought it to a head. All the black people in this room knew Bittenheim was going to get off. You know how we knew? Because they always get off. It's not a love. It's not a love that we die at the hands of police or whoever happens to have blood lust that day. We, I can, every day, I can walk out of the house and I'm not sure I'll come back alive. I don't know if you know this, but one of the things that I do for my boundaries is I don't accept unknown phone, phone calls. And I don't accept them because I get hate calls. The United Faith has me on their list somewhere. And every now and then the FBI calls, calls me and say, you need to be on your lookout because uh, these things have done being happening. These things have been printed and your name is on the list of people's houses that ought to be targeted if uh, somebody wants to foment a race riot. So I've determined I'm gonna live the life that God has given me and I'm not gonna worry about it, but I'm also not gonna fool with any unknown phone calls. I don't have time for that. So I'm not afraid when I am aware. Now you may not experience that and because you don't experience it, you may not think that's real, but it is real. <laughs> It's rather like if I tell you that's what happens to me and you go, oh, no such thing. That would never happen in this country. It's rather like it's the same thing as, as you, my, me telling you when you tell me, oh, my leg is broken. And I say, of course not. Your leg isn't broken because mine isn't broken. You see, if we tell people that what they experience is not real, we're gaslighting them and we're breaking the bonds of relationship. Because if you tell me, Pastor Lid, that I have hurt you, I need to at least stop and say, oh, I'm sorry. And if I don't know how I've hurt you, I need to say, tell me what I did so I won't do it again. And I am so sorry. So the black folks in this room, we knew that Rittenhouse was going to walk, even though he was the only one who shot anybody. And even though he had a, an unregistered gun, with his 17-year-old self, that his mama took him out of state to go to do what he did, we knew that he would get off on every single charge. And I remember one point I found myself praying, how long, oh Lord, is the old prayer in this country? It was a great, great relief that the Alma, in the Ahmad Aubrey trial, those people were convicted of the murder because they hunted that young baby down and they killed him because he was black. And because they knew, they thought they were gonna get away with it and I held my breath because I wasn't sure they weren't going to get away with it. And in the uh, signs Kesley, Kesley trial, thank goodness they um, leveled some charges at them, but it's kind of a uneven, isn't it? Because it's not over. And let me tell you why, why these texts are so important. Because when we believe in God, when we try to do the right thing, no matter our color, no matter our sexual orientation, no matter anything, when we try to do the right thing, we're going to go through long stretches of foolishness and injustice. And we say, how long, oh God. As a preacher, when I try to make sense of the world's happenings and how to talk about God in the midst of them, I have to ask the question, so what is going on? And I've come to several conclusions. Now, it's the conclusion of right now, and it may, may change as I grow, grow older and perhaps, and perhaps come wiser, become some wiser. But what has happened in this country, in my view, is that we have mixed Christianity and white nationalism. And that does not a church name. In fact, it perverts the word, word of God. And I, who am 66, who have believed firmly in the American dream, although I've never seen it realized, 
have to look at those things and figure out how do I go on? How do I go on believing in the American dream and believing in the kingdom of God? And the first thought is that they are not the same. We have completed them in this country, but the American dream and the kingdom of God are not the same. What we who are followers after Christ have to learn to do is dream new dreams. The kingdom of God is now and is coming. Until it is actualized in its full extent, we have to act as if. We have to live our lives by the rule of God, by kingdom rules, loving each other, forbearing each other, putting up with each other, helping each other, encouraging each other, even though we may not want to, even though we may not even like each other. Whether I like you or not doesn't make any difference to God. Let me say that again. Whether I like you or whether you like me does not matter to God in the kingdom of God. God says, act as if you do. And soon you will. And soon we will. The kingdom of God is at hand, says Jesus and his disciples. What does that mean? You have it within your grasp. It's inside you. It's inside me. All we have to do is act as if, that is, live it out. Live like we believe it. Love like we believe it. Talk like we believe it. Walk like we believe it. But there's some things we have to let go in order to act as if. And what I'm letting go is belief in the American dream. Because I truly believe it's dead. But that doesn't mean the kingdom isn't coming. You hear me? America is not going to be all right, y'all. I said it today. Remember, America is not all right. It is not going to be all right. We have, many of us have decided that we will not pull for the majority. We will not pull for each other. We want our group, our clan to win over everybody. And you can do that. I can do that, except that the end result is that we don't have that dream anymore. And if you doubt it, look at how we responded to the COVID-19 crisis. It's a deadly virus. If you don't believe the science, look at all the people around you who have dropped dead. At one point in my life, somebody I knew died every week. More than one somebody of COVID-19. We could have got hold of the virus if all of us would say, you know what, let's do what is for the greater good. Let's get vaccinated. Because not to get vaccinated means that this thing is still in the air and it's still morphing. Variants are still propping up. And guess what? Well, I declare this Omicron uh, variant now. And they were told it started in Africa, but as the scientists told us, and as the Holy Spirit should have whispered in our ears, if we don't eradicate the virus everywhere, it's going to keep coming back everywhere. So it can't be that only the rich, because you know every politician in this country, except the ones who are claiming that they don't believe in the virus, has been vaccinated well before any of us did. Everybody on Fox News, by their own company policy, is vaccinated, y'all. I don't care what they tell. I don't care what call, care what Tucker Tolson tells you. Tucker Tolson is vaccinated. He had to be in order to get access into the building. But he's still telling people that the virus is a hoax and that you ought not to get the vaccination. Black folks, I'm talking about us right now, we are dumb as dirt. <laughs> not to have been vaccinated by now. We die more often and, and, uh, and sooner than anybody in the society. And we talk about, I don't need the vaccine. Now, it's one thing if a white conservative decides to get unvaccinated because somehow they think that we're taking their freedom away. And if you want to die, feel free. You do that on your own. I'm not ready yet. But if you don't get vaccinated, don't come around me. Don't cough around me. Stay home with your unvaccinated self. Don't kill your mama, your children, and your dog and parakeet. You can make the decision. What we have to realize is that when we make a decision, other folks got to make decisions too. 
which is why three months before we could open again, we sent letters to everyone saying, we understand that you want church to be open again, and we want church to be open again. But here's the deal. In order to do it, we must be vaccinated. We must wear face masks. We must. We want our children and grandchildren and nieces and cousins to come to church. But guess what? They're beautiful and they're lovely, but they're the biggest germ balls in the world. They cannot be vaccinated yet. They can't come to church. They can't. Not because we don't love them, but we're trying to keep us all alive. You hear what I'm saying? We have to work together to come to consensus and agree together on what has to happen in order for all of us to be all right. I can't live my life as though yours does not matter. And you can't live your life as though mine does not matter. Oh, we could, but what we get then is the end of the American dream. But praise God. It is not the end of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is now and is within us. And the Lord asks us to remember, no matter how hard it is to wait, no matter what we have to put up with, no matter the, the bad language and the specious thinking and the conspiracy thingles, God says, God says, I am and my word is true. Learn how to separate the truth from fiction. And wherever the, the truth has been bound up with fiction, ask God to give you the spirit. Ask God, I ask God to give me the wisdom to untangle them. The American dream is not the kingdom of God. We have conflated it. And we have so corrupted it that until and unless we are able, as, as a human species, to decide it is more important to give than to receive. That we will keep the earth alive. We will not be so concerned about making a dollar today that the rest of the world and the future can go to hell. Until we can come to that conclusion, we have killed many a dream. We kill most dreams. But the truth will last. And the kingdom of God is now in as at hand and is within you and me. Whether America lives or dies, we're going to be all right, people of God. We may not look like we're used to. We may not function the way we want it to. But we will be all right because God said so. But there are things we are deciding right now that we don't need. <laughs> And among them appears to be the American dream. <clears throat> All right. So we don't need it. But we do need the kingdom of God. And we have that. Let's work together, brothers and sisters. Let's love together. Let's fuss together. Let's love together. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Holy One, giving up dreams is hard. The American dream is one I've held dear for 66 years. It looks mighty much to me like that's not going to happen. But what is going to happen is your kingdom coming. Come now, Lord. Come. We ask it. In Jesus' name.